This program will now start. Before we get started, I want to thank the folks at BPA for bringing this event to the attention of their publishers. They do great work, and this program is just an indication of the commitment they have to help their publishers succeed. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Tyler, and I'll be your host. My career spans the last 36 years, and I've enjoyed many management titles, including publisher of over 12, in over 12 industries, president of two media companies, and of late founder and CEO of World Business Media, publishers of the first Homeland Security magazine, Government Security News, which I've since sold. And I truly feel your pain when it comes to the void in digital magazine revenue development. At this time, I'd like to introduce Larry Jenkin. He's launched 26 magazines in 10 industries, the founder of, of 11 Media, and over the last three years, he and his tech team in their virtual garage have built the next generation of digital publishing software. USA Today is a first marquee client and examples of before and after will be shown during this presentation. Today, Larry is recognized as one of the foremost experts on digital media. Let's introduce the program. Magazines are about to get Napster. The tech and business model that will transform traditional print and digital replica magazines. Let's go. Publishing, like the music industry of the 90s, is being disrupted. For many, they're too close to see what's going on. They only see ad sales or circulation modestly declining. They don't see the big picture of what is happening. Today, we're going to try and show the big picture, specifically the technology and new business methods that are changing everything. You get to choose if you're the disrupted or the disruptor. I'd like to just post an important statement here. Many of you have sat through webinars, and you know if you want to post a question, you can. For those of you that haven't, go ahead and send it to me by clicking the question mark uh, icon on the left sidebar. Uh, I'll either work it into the program or we'll answer questions Q&A at the end uh, where we'll leave a little time. Let's get ready to go. Larry, are you ready? I'm ready, Ed. Okay. In the 1990s, a tectonic shift happened in the music industry where music sales dropped off a cliff because consumers became able to get virtually any song ever recorded through music sharing programs like Napster, a name we'll never forget. Nearly 20 years later, they still haven't recovered. Larry, you've publicly spoken about how a similar dynamic is happening in publishing. Why do you feel this way? Well, I mean, there are a great many parallels uh, I see in what's happening today in publishing uh, compared to what happened in the 1990s with, uh, with uh, the, 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 the Napster phenomenon. And if you think back to that time when Napster came about, what most people don't realize is that over a period of, of a decade, now that's not a short period of time, but in you, you look at where the record industry was in the beginning and at the end of that 10-year period of time, and half of the sales were completely lost. And what is happening, you kind of said this in your intro, Ed, where magazine sales and readership are gradually declining. And so it's not like it falls off a cliff, but when you look back over a period of time, the change is massive. And what I've been able to see is that, you know, when, when you look back at the uh, music industry, you had these virgin megastores and the tower megastores. Literally every shopping mall had a, a Wii 3 or a Sam Goody record, not to mention all the mom and pop record stores. And today, they're all gone. And so what's really important is to learn the lessons of this. So when it comes to our industry, the magazine industry, that, that you can learn that lesson so that you can compete, avoid it happening to you, and even better, take advantage of the opportunity that's present. And so when you look at the, uh, the revolution in the music industry, there were really three main drivers of that. The first was the technology format. We went from CDs into mp3 files where you could rip a cd and now have all of those files available as individual 
uh, data files that actually could be played not only on your computer, but in the beginning there were these MP3 file, uh, players that eventually got popularized with the, uh, the, the, the I, iTunes store and uh, eventually the iPod. Then there was the consumer bundle. If you think about it, we uh, were forced as consumers to buy CDs. We might only have liked one or two songs on that CD, but they forced us to buy that full album. Whereas MP3s, one of the big drivers of it, was that if people wanted an individual song, they could easily get at that. And then, of course, there's the price, right? You went from being forced to pay, you know, somewhere, you know, $12, $13, $14 dollars for a CD down to nothing. In the beginning, you know, when Napster came about, there was this legal gray area, so it wasn't illegal to, to do this, and it was completely for free. If you look today, and, you know, the, the, the business model of publishing is, is really transforming along the same lines. So the old school version of magazines, and let's just talk about the digital publishing revolution, not to mention the fact that, that print editions are migrating to digital. And when you look at the technology format of digital magazines, what we've been dealing with for almost the last 10 years or so are print replicas. You're taking a print publication, you're squishing it down into a computer, or further squishing it down into a tablet, or even worse yet, into a smartphone where there's so much readership going. And the problem is, it's a terrible reading experience. The new school of publishing is where you don't have print uh, replicas, but rather animated interactive editions. And we'll, we'll show that technology today. The consumer bundle is also changing. And you see this primarily on social media, where you go from us as publishers marketing the full issue to where you can get lots of readership for individual stories. And that is uh, another change that's almost similar uh, to, to, to the Napster revolution. The price per issue is also changing. Now, B2B publishers, who I know are many on this call, um, we're used to having controlled publications. Consumer publishers aren't. And people pay for those magazines dearly, but content on the internet wants to be free. And those that um, put up paywalls, uh, you know, there are very, very few success stories with paywalls. And another revolution that's happening is the one in ad pricing. And we'll talk about that today as well. Whereas advertising primarily has been sold on a per issue basis. You purchase an ad and you get, you know, uh, you, you get a period of time, whether that's a week or a month or, or two months, whatever it might be. Now on the paper performance basis, it's a revolution that's really driven by what Google has done where advertisers can buy ads, pay only on performance, and do that with the benefits of a magazine. So um, those are some of the things that I really see that are, 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 are apropos comparisons to what happened with Napster Ed. Um, I'll tell you, what an eye-opening uh, comparison. Um, and, and to go a little further in this comparison, People in the music industry were blind to the MP3. It wasn't until 2001 with the advent of iTunes and the iPod that they realized they were seeing the future of music. Is there a parallel, a similar technology assumption publishers are making that they won't be able to recover from until it's too late? Absolutely. I, I think that that is digital magazine software. Um, when you... You know, here, here's here's a, a great example. Um, right now, if and I talk to a lot of publishers, and and publishers will say, well, we're getting away from our digital magazine, and we're focusing on our website, or we're, you know, they're trying to make money in all these different ways that aren't their core product, because you know what, they got to pay the bills, they got to keep the lights on, and so they'll get into events, and they'll get into native advertising, and they'll they'll do all these other gyrations because they're not able to make money digitally. And, and what they make the conclusion of is that people don't like the digital magazines. And it's because, and I, I'll give a, an example here in a second, is that digital magazines, especially these print replicas, are a horrible experience. And it makes me think, Ed, back to the days of, uh, I don't know if you know this, or many people don't, is that Kodak, invented digital photography. 
And you think now that the people who have popularized digital photography, companies that are worth multi-billion dollars, like um, uh, you take Instagram, which was bought by Facebook, or companies uh, like Shutterfly and, and, and others who were really uh, GoPro, you know, with the camera that had a, a very successful IPO. And what happened within Kodak when they developed this technology, I believe it was in the 60s, that they looked at it and said, this is a non-starter. This, it's horrible. It's expensive. People aren't going to, it's complicated. And so even though they invented it, they were not the ones who popularized it because they abandoned it and they paid the ultimate price for that. And the, and the lesson that we all need to learn from this is that technology evolves. You have to look a little bit ahead of where this is going to be in six months, 12 months from now. And, and I think that that's a real big lesson. And, and let's get into that. Let me kind of show you uh, some examples so that eyes can be opened as to where the digital magazine software has evolved to, if, that, if that's okay, Ed. Absolutely. That's perfectly timed. All right. So let's do this. I'm going to pull over here. Let me see. Let's do this. I'm going to pull over uh, on the screen here. You'll see... Uh, an issue you mentioned at the top of the uh, of the show, USA Today, right? Now, we work with USA Today in their magazine group. They publish about 18 magazines a year. And this is the magazine that we, we got from them. And if you look at it in this basic page replica software. Now, by the way, when you see this screen, this is on a 27-inch huge monitor, okay? And I, and I have, I don't even wear glasses, right? I can't read these ads unless I do something like this, right? And when you start to look and you get into editorial, let's just go to, like, well, let's go to an editorial page. You know, you have to do this kind of thing to be able to see it. And the problem is, readers, unless this was life or death material, nobody's going to do that. And let's, let's give a separate example, because we all know that the, the digital readership is being driven by the smartphone. So what I'm going to do here, if I can do this in a second, I'm going to pull up um, my smartphone replicator, and I will do this here. Don't try this at home. So hopefully that comes up. So now this, what you're looking at on this screen is an iPhone 6 Plus, so the biggest iPhone that there is. And if you look at that, it's unreadable, right? Unless you do this kind of manipulation on your phone, and that's literally only a little, you know, two paragraphs. What happens when you go to a, uh, you know, a, let's go to a full editorial page. Let's just fair. Okay, you're going to read that? It's impossible, right? And this is why when you look at statistics and say, well, people don't spend time with my, my digital magazine or we don't have great open rates. Well, the reason you don't have great open rates is because they opened it initially, they saw this kind of experience, and they hated it. They, they're not willing to do this kind of thing in order to be able to read the pages, and so they don't open it anymore, and they don't view your digital issue, and you look at it, and you make the conclusion that people aren't interested in that. And, you know, it reminds me of a, of a story that my old mentor, Bill Bartman, who at one point in time was the 25th wealthiest individual in the U.S., I went to work for him, and he said, you know, Larry, 70% of our business comes from Canada. What do you conclude based on knowing that? And I said, well, Bill, we got to, you know, Canada obviously loves your stuff, and we should spend more time in Canada. And he says, that's the wrong answer. I said, okay, why? He said, the reason 70% of our sales come from Canada is because I spent 200 days in the last year traveling and speaking through Canada. The results are only because of that effort. Doesn't mean that Canada is any better or they might be worse than other markets. So statistics lie. And let's talk about the experience. So I'm going to pull this off the screen and let's talk about or let's show more likely what happened with the USA Today when we put it into our Mag Titan software. So the first thing you'll notice is that the software is single page, right? But it looks, the cover looks exactly the same, right? So 
let me show you what happens. I'm going to reload the page here, and you'll see the experience when they come to the USA Today Home Edition in Mag Titan. Right? Pretty cool, huh? And let's let's go through. I'm just going to give a couple other quick examples. Then we'll come back to the USA Today. Um, let's go to, I love the Godfather. So I'm going to open up a magazine called uh, Crushing It. Now, while, while this, this loads, what I want you to understand is we pay a lot of attention to the experience. So watch how this goes. give you another example. This is a trade magazine for the legal cannabis industry, and you'll either be appalled at this or you'll get a chuckle out of it. Um, but it, when it loads, it kind of initially looks like a regular magazine. But as our readers start to go through and they read it, then watch what happens. And so magazines shouldn't be static. They shouldn't be boring, even especially trade magazines, right? We're in the business of delivering an experience to our readers that includes our content, but it includes also the design. And let's, let's go back to the USA Today. I want to show you a little bit about the future of the magazine so you can see when it's presented in a way that's a great experience, how, one, you can gain a competitive advantage, but also how readers will adopt this, just like digital technology for photographs took a little while. So, Larry, you know, Larry, Larry before, before you move on, could you go over all of the different uh, buttons and icons that are on that right-hand side? Sure, everything is designed for digital, right? So we don't make people, why have the table of contents on the second or third page or whatever? We have the table of contents constantly uh, available. We make subscriptions available. If you notice, I just entered a URL. All of this is browser-based because I don't believe in apps because as publishers, we want to make it easy for clients to get into our content. And if you put it in an app store where nobody's going to frankly find it unless you're Time Magazine or The New Yorker, you know, you can put all these obstacles where they have to find your app, download it, take up a lot of storage space, then they have to get the individual publication, which takes up more storage space. Then if you do all that, good luck getting them back for the next time. So we make it so come into the publication, and then you can enter and subscribe uh, and put whatever information right here. So now you as a publisher control all that data. We make social sharing real easy, advertising real easy, you know, the newsstand where you can bring people to all your other publications. So, you know, I, 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 I think that when you start – to look at the experience, everything from the ground up here is designed for digital, and that means that we pay as much or more attention to digital as you, sh you pay to, to print. If you treat digital like an afterthought, then you're not going to be successful. You, you have to pay attention to digital, and that's, that's what we do. Um, did that help, Ed? Uh, it did. That was uh, that was great. It, they're very very simple and easy to use. Well, it's yeah. It's it's that it took a lot of time to get there. What I'm going to pull up here, I'm going to I want to show the mobile experience and compare because readability is one of the key key things. And as the USA Today issue loads here, you'll see that it works as well on my iPhone as it does uh, on a much more powerful desktop computer. But notice also. Um, the software changes based on the device that the user's in. Notice here that the navigation is much more scaled back because we just don't have the real estate that's there. Um, and when you get into the software, um, like, let, let's do this. I want to show one great example of this. I'm going to go to the same story here, this Modern Muses story. Now, if we were to compare this, let me bring in, just so you can see the transformation. I'm going to bring in here the original USA Today issue. 
And I'm going to flip forward to this modern muses story. Now, USA Today has beautiful design. There's no question about it. But we had a fundamental problem in the transformation that gets to the reader experience. Here you have a two-page spread. Now, forget the fact that it, the text is unreadable because we're squishing things down. But how do you create this tone, this feel in digital where we don't have two-page spreads because in digital, it doesn't make sense. Two-page spreads only are a replication of print. So what we've done here, and you can see it, is we've taken and used an animation to create this similar experience, but one where the text is readable and where it has that, that beautiful uh, magazine-like experience. But now watch this, Ed. Here, in the, in the bigger desktop version, this modern Musa story is one of ten pages. But if you look here, and I know you can't see it because it's too small, but on the iPhone, it's one of 23 pages. So what we're not doing, let, let, me, let me show you what this means. So if we go to the second page, and I flip down to the second pages here, well, they sort of look similar, but they're actually very different. The caption is not in the picture, it's below it, and this ends at the byline where there's more text here. If we go down another page, so we're on page three of both publications, now you'll notice the design has changed even further. Here we have two page, uh, two column design, here we have one column design. But let me, let me ask you this, Ed, I mean, it, as you look at this, could you read it? Do you, do you need to zoom on either of these to be able to see it and to be able to read it? Uh, no, I can definitely read it, and I actually spend an awful lot of time on my iPhone. Uh, unfortunately, a little frustrated because a lot of the things on my iPhone I can't read. That's right. But on yours, I could read this story. Well, that's right. And, and, and so what we're not doing, this is part of, well, what we are doing is we're taking each page, and the software, the MagTitan software, is dynamically redesigning it into 318 different sizes. So that regardless of the uh, regardless of the device, regardless of the browser, regardless of the resolution that is set, um, as you can see, this is really a, uh, a, a, a phone. It's my phone, right? Um, it, it doesn't matter. It adjusts it dynamically. And so when we when we look at the future, the other thing that people make the mistake and say that well, what you've done is is responsive design. It's not. What responsive design is, if you start to look here, is this infinite scroll pages. And let me kind of go to some different stories here. As, you, as, you flip, as I flip through this, when you think of responsive design, you lose formatting, and that means you lose ads. And when you lose ads, that means the only ads that you are able to put in there are banner ads. We have preserved the page so that when you have ads in here, you have beautiful full page ads. And, um, and, and that's really key to being able to have a sustainable business model. So I could go on and on, but you know, hopefully this kind of illustrates what is capable with this next generation uh, of, of the software. Uh, Larry, it's, uh, it's crystal clear that um, any editor uh, would love to get their uh, hands around this platform taking their static content and making it almost TV-esque. Um, but we're talking to publishers today. What about the money? Most publishers have a model where they charge for print ads and give away ads in their digital edition to incentivize more print buys. Very few publishers, unfortunately, are making money with digital advertising. Yeah. How do you address the financial side? Well... All right, let's 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 get into that because that's really, that is uh, critical. So the industry-wide megatrend, and everybody intuitively knows this, but here's some research from Zenith Optimedia that illustrates that ad dollars and readership are moving away from print and towards digital, right? And so if you look where magazine is, magazine and newspaper advertising are the only medium that are actually declining uh, in global ad spend. And where are the big, big gainers? 
It is in mobile digital and digital desktop advertising, which, okay, let's, let's just call it, it's digital advertising. That is where the growth is. And this, again, gets to the whole point about the Napster and the music industry decline. You can't, you, you, you know, let, let, let's look at it this way. Companies that figure out how to make money digitally are the ones that are going to win and dominate this ne next generation. You know, in, in, in music, Apple figured it out first, and they went from being a failing computer maker to the most valuable company on the planet. And at the start of this is you got to have ads that are readable, right? So, so doing this replica, when you do that approach, the, the reality of it is you're going to be forced to give away your digital ads because nobody's going to want to pay for an ad that can't be read. Um, if you're going to succeed in digital, you have to have a better ad value proposition. And let me show you what I, I think that that ad value proposition looks like. Um, let me pull over here. I have another uh, example. Let's, let's do this and move this over. So what I have here is a little uh, demo area. And uh, I want to show some of the ad technology that, you know, it amazes me that people – use Google AdWords, and they pay multiple dollars per click. And sometimes for really competitive keywords, you're talking $30, $40, $50 for a single click. Well, we need, as magazine publishers, we need to create a better mousetrap. So let's look at what the ads are capable of using these really powerful digital devices and, and our software. Here's an example of a BMW ad. And first you can see how visually striking it is by using a video background. So in advertising, we've got to stop the prospect, right? If you were on a static ad like this, it's visually boring and you might stop them, you might not. When you go to something like this, it's a lot easier. But next is, why as publishers do we tell advertisers that you can only have a page or a two-page spread or a fractional if in a digital edition? It makes no sense. In digital, it doesn't cost us any more to give them multiple pages. Um, you know, when we limit it to page, it's a factor of we're replicating print. So we say, using our technology, Mr. Advertiser, you can have an infinite number of pages, and oh, by the way, they're interactive, and you can do all these things. So let's look at that. So here for BMW, the reader can say, well, what kind of car am I interested in? Let's say they pick an SUV. Well, they click it. Now they're on the second page of the BMW ad, all about SUVs. They could select their desired price range. Let's say they picked the middle price range. Now they're on the third page of the BMW ad with all the models in their price range. They can click any model and see what it's like behind the wheel. Let's pick the X3. I can actually take a virtual test drive. Grab life by the road in the BMW X3 Sports Activity v Right? So we give this multimedia experience. And notice how fast it worked, by the way. And then let's say they're really interested. we got a hot prospect. They can contact the dealer. Now, what most people are thinking, well, great, we could put a link in our publication. And, and digital editions have been putting links in it, you know, since the very beginning. But what the problem with that is, we work so hard to get a reader into our publication. If we put a link and send them outside of the publication, there's a good chance we've just lost that reader because they're not going to come back. And that's bad for us as publishers. On the other side, making that reader leave to go to the BMW website isn't good for BMW either because the readers are reading our content. They might not want to leave, and a high percentage of them won't want to leave, so they're not going to do it. So our philosophy in building the software is don't bring the reader to the website. Bring the website to the reader. So watch what happens when we click the contact dealer. This technology, we call it the web window. And now we are actually on the BMW website. Within the BMW ad, we haven't left our magazine. I could flip the pages and, 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 and with no problem. So, Ed, what's your, what's your zip code where you're at? 11706. I'm sorry, 11706. Okay. So we're going to get you a new, a new vehicle. So uh, we're going to click search. And, Ed, when you're ready to get that, that new BMW, Haverstad BMW of Bayshore on Sunrise Highway, that's the one you want to go to. They're the closest to you. I just picked up my BMW yesterday. 
Uh, did you get a me one? Call. A service call. Ah, well, very nice. So, so we interact with this, and it's much richer. Let, let's go through a couple other, you know, quick examples of what's possible. Um, let's talk about animations, right? How do you make an ad come to life? So I'm going to flip through. Now, for the publishers on the line who are B2B, which is most of you, um, this isn't going to be a client you're going to get. But pay attention to the technology, not to the advertiser. And this is a movie ad. Look what we did to jazz up the movie ad and catch attention. Oops, let's go here. So now I've got the attention. I can click the trailer. I could literally watch a full trailer. The fans, Danny. I could watch the full trailer. I could watch a webinar. I could, I could literally watch anything within the, the magazine as long or as short as they want it to be. But even better is the shopping cart functionality. If I wanted to actually purchase this ticket, I could now go in here through Fandango. I could edit, uh, enter my, uh, my state, my zip code, and my credit card, and I can actually make a purchase of the ticket uh, uh, right through the right through the publication, and it's all through their secure shopping cart. It has nothing to do with us. It's just uh, the mechanism to generate sales. So lead generation isn't the holy grail anymore. It's a, a sales consummation. Here's another example of animations, and this is an ad for JetBlue, and it looks like a video, but this isn't video, so it will totally play on any mobile device. And, and look this way. And you know what? If you're so inclined and you want to shop on JetBlue's uh, website and be able to uh, plan a trip or, you know, manage your flight, you can do that. You could actually just go and you could purchase the ticket right through the, 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 the JetBlue website. So these are just some of the things that are, are possible. It's a much better mousetrap for, uh, for, for advertisers and, and then eventually for us as publishers because we're appealing to the advertisers and what they're looking for. Larry, as I saw you uh, show the demonstration, I was relating back to uh, my last magazine, Government Security News. My largest advertiser was a company called Axis. And I think in every meeting I ever had with them, they ask about how could we use more video? How could we use more animation? I wish I had this platform then, but I could see Axis developing something like the BP, like the uh, BMW ad, where they were using their cameras. Uh, they're the world's largest seller of cameras. They would, I could see them using their cameras shooting night vision. I could see them using their cameras shooting from bridges and really tying an all-inclusive story together. Um, so let's move on to what I think the publishers that have joined us today care about. So what do you think the business model looks like for actually making money with digital advertising? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't look like. Um, it doesn't look like banner ads, especially for publishers who aren't uh, Huffington Post or have, you know, 20 million uniques coming to their website. You know, banner ads, everybody hear this. Banner ads, you hear all this about programmatic and all of this. The average price from a programmatic banner ad on a website today for the publisher is under a dollar per thousand. And I, I don't care if you're getting $100 per thousand for banner ads. If you have 10, 20, 30, 50,000 visitors to your website per month, you are not going to make enough money from banner ads. And worse yet, you, get, you are just cannibalizing your business by allowing advertisers to reach your audience on the cheap through banner ads on your website. So I think that that is a, a, a flaw. What, and what I think is the, uh, the future of, of advertising, it, it looks a lot like Google. Um, if you think about what Google has done, about 1 in 12 of every ad dollars on the planet are spent with Google. And the reason for that is that Google has done two things. They popularized uh, two things that absol advertisers absolutely love. The first of them is that advertisers love to only pay for results. Google's ad proposition is 
if somebody doesn't click on your little text ad, you don't pay. And advertisers love that proposition. The second thing that Google has done is they said, set your own budget. We don't care if you have $4 or $400,000. You know, you can advertise with us. If it's only $4, great. We'll run your ad until your $4 are used up. Then we're going to take your ad out, and you have to pay more to get access to our audience. And I think that we now have built the technology to do that for magazines, but with the beauty and things that you just saw from these ad, ad examples. Um, you know what I'd love to do, Ed, with, with your permission, is I have a calculator that can show the new economics of, uh, uh, of, of advertising. Would that be helpful? Uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, if you could briefly show the financial model, I've got lots of other questions for you. So, Ed, what you're looking at here is a calculator um, that is actually it's publicly available um, if anybody is interested and wants to use this um, I'll give you my email at the end and you can uh, send an email and I'll shoot this over to you but let, let's talk about the economics Ed. so you're, you're a B2B publisher let's imagine Ed um, uh, your number of readers let's start with that what's the input of the number of digital readers on a monthly basis 40,000 40,000 alright now as with Google, our technology, which is called Ad Einstein, gives publishers the option of pay-per-performance-based advertising. For our publications, we charge a dollar every time an ad is viewed. And, the, and what we mean by a verified view, you'll hear that metric, um, is the, either somebody clicks on the ad or they spend 10 seconds or more on the ad. Because if they're spending 10 seconds or more on the ad, we know that they're reading it to some degree. We did our job as a publisher, and we should get paid. So we charge a dollar for our magazines. What do you want? Your, your, your audience, Ed, you know, if it's government security news, might be it is much more exclusive, and you might be able to get, you know, $8 per thousand. But you tell me, what do you want to enter for pay per verified view price? Let's just stay with the dollar. So we'll do a dollar. So here's what this calculates. On the top line here are the readers per issue. So you said 40,000. You go as low as 20,000, as high as 80,000. So you can see different scenarios of how much money you would make in this Google paper verified view model. On the vertical axis, these are how many ads were actually triggered. So somebody could read 20 ads, but we're talking about the ads they click on or view for 10 seconds or more that we actually get to charge them. So let's imagine here in this scenario that a viewer goes through and they only view one ad. Well, you have 40,000 readers, one ad. That means that month, Ed, you made $40,000 from digital advertising through the pay-per-view technology. If more likely, let's say that they view three, four, or five ads, you can kind of see the, the, how those numbers change. I mean, this to me is the power of Google, and it's the power of small numbers, right? Because when you say to the advertiser, look, Mr. Advertiser, advertising with us is really cool. You get these beautiful full-page ads. You have all these high-tech features. You have unlimited number of pages, and you're only going to pay if somebody if we can verify that somebody has read your ad and you get to set your own budget, so don't take our word for it. What's an insignificant amount of budget that you can allocate to test this? I mean, it's a superior value proposition. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, it definitely does. Uh, I think what I would like to do is you've made an offer to pass this calculator on to the publishers that are attending today. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea. They could look at their audience, they could do the calculation and start to look at what the possibilities are. I, I would like to simply move on to content. Okay. Um, you'll never be successful selling advertising without content that your readers value and want to spend time with. Yep. Well, let's talk about the content creation side of the business. Yep. What do you see as the model for creating magazine content that works in the future? Well, I've spent a lot of time. You know, we, we publish over 19 magazines, and uh, this is something that I've, I've thought about a lot. And, and I, frankly, you know, have launched print publications. And the first thing that I would do when I launched my publications, I'd go out and hire an editor-in-chief. 
I hire a, mag, uh, a, a managing editor, and I might have a, a staff writer or two, not to mention whoever I would use as a freelancer to put together all the content both for my magazine and for my website. And before you know it, you now have a major nut that you have to overcome each month with those salaries and benefit packages that you have to award. In this new world, you know, you have to keep expenses very, very low. Just this past week, Condé Nast laid off a whole bunch of staffers. GQ was the first targeted. But even the biggest publishers are making major cutbacks because as industry income declines in the traditional model, if you can't sell, you, you've got to cut expenses. So here's the model with editor. I'm going to show you an example of staffing. All right, and I love this example because uh, if you think like an investor, this is an investor's wet dream, right? The old school model is what you see Inc. doing, and I just copied straight from their masthead. They have one publication and 140 staffers. Now, not all of those are editorial ad, um, but you have everything, uh, you know, from mid-level management making a couple hundred grand a year to, you know, to, 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 to people who are in circulation and, and everything in between. Our publications, and this is literal, we published 19 magazines, and you see our masthead there, right? And even at the top of it, where I, I pulled it from Game Changer Magazine, the publisher there, Lee Steinberg, is our partner. He's the figurehead. He doesn't even work in the day-to-day -day of the publication. He provides, you know, high-level guidance and is a, uh, is a partner, but isn't working in the day-to-day. -day. So from content contribution, what is important for publishers to realize is that when you hire editorial staff, those people are trained journalists. They are not world-class experts in their publications. And the fact is that many of us, in our, to our backs, we're called a trade rag. And the reason we're called trade rags is because the grizzled, gray-haired veterans of that industry don't find value in what we publish. We can't teach them anything that they don't know. And the reason is because our editorial staff isn't experts in the industry, they're great writers, and the best that they can do is maybe interview people and do a little bit of research. So the model that we have to produce all the content here, and by the way, Ed, I would put up the content of our publications against any magazine in the category. And the reason I am so confidently able to say that is because what we do with our editorial staff, which by the way, is a two-person editorial staff, we have a world-class editor, best in the business as far as I'm concerned, and we have uh, an associate publisher who's an editorial recruiter. And they would go out to the best and brightest minds in that industry and recruit those people to write for us. And they'll do it for free, and then they con contribute, and then my editor whips it into shape. So now that you get very great content, but with style, with flair, um, and with, you know, with, with the expertise that a professional journalist can, can bring to the table. So I, I see that is the way forward, where you're tapping experts for free with a bare-bone professional journalism staff. The economics work and the end product is actually better than when you have just, you know, uh, generalist journalists writing your content. One of the things that uh, I felt as a publisher was when we launched our digital magazine, my editorial staff, and I did have a large one, uh, felt like they had to take on more responsibility and more work, et cetera. So what you're saying is for the publishers that are on this call today, they can use their current editorial team, but their current editorial team to develop digital content can actually go to the marketplace and get experts to fill those pages or use the content from their current magazine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, a lot of publishers have all this content on their website, and they're monetizing it through banner ads. Well, banner ads pay, you know, a couple dollars per thousand. Well, think about this. That content, if you package it differently, can yield so much more money. And I, I love this example, right? So somebody writes a book. And they could sell that book for 19.95. But if they take that same book and recorded it 
uh, as a video and put it on DVD, that book, that same content, could maybe go for forty nine ninety five. And then you know what? If you took that same content and you made it a weekend seminar, it could go for two thousand dollars. And it's the same content. So format really, really does matter. And you have all this content on your website. Think about launching a second magazine, a third magazine, because literally using digital and don't roll presses, don't do that stuff um, uh, unless it, you really are confident that you can get a quick return. Make it digital, and with the model that that calculator shows, you'll, you'll generate much more profit without the risk um, from the content you're already creating. One last question on content, Larry. Um, I know... Uh, running government security news for 13 years. We had lots and lots and lots and lots of archived issues. I always looked at them as a place that drew very interesting research traffic, but could just never figure out how to monetize it. Yep. Is there an opportunity on your platform for that? Well, absolutely, because it, it gets to the heart of what Google does. You know, think about Google, right? Or th think about your magazines, Ed, right? You put it in, the ads run, and then it goes out of print and it's archived. Those ads never change. And frankly, the, reason, the only reason we as publishers have um, monthly issues is, be, and why do we do monthly? It's because we get to bill our clients again. We say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, the October issue is over. Now, if you want to be in our November issue, you got to pay again. That's the reason why we've done that. And so with, uh, if you use this replica software, you're stuck. But if you use software that allows ads to dynamically come in and out, you think about Google, right? Google has this marketplace of ads. The advertiser can run uh, ads, uh, and those ads will run on the various websites that Google has. Um, and if they push pause on their ad, which they can do in Google, they can do it in our platform, those ads stop running. So imagine now, Ed, that your magazine was populated with dynamic ads that even if you only have 100 viewers going to your archives a month, but those ads are live, and anytime somebody clicks on that ad or spends 10 seconds on their ad, you're making money from it. That's how you monetize archives. I'm starting to get it. Um, I wanted to make sure that we leave some time at the end for Q&A. Yep. So let, let, me, uh, let me move on. Uh, the topic of circulation. We've seen companies that didn't exist a few years ago, Business Insider, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, with audiences dwarfing those of much more established publishers. Should publishers play in this world? And if so, how can they compete? Well, Hell yes, you should play in this world. I mean, think about it. If these companies that have valuations um, in hundreds of millions and sometimes of billions, they're publishers, they're just digital publishers, and they're, you know, we're stuck in this old mentality that we're magazine publishers, and they're, they're, there's, you know, we defend our turf, but why not learn the lessons of what's made them so valuable and co-opt it because we're ideally positioned to, to take advantage of that. Um, and so here's, here's how you play in that world, in, in my opinion. Let me kind of bring back uh, uh, an example here. Let's bring over, uh, bring back Crushing It magazine, okay? So first off, when you look here, uh, we borrowed a page from uh, YouTube's uh, business. And if you look here, there's an embed code, right? Now think about this, Ed. Let's imagine you make money every time an ad in your publication is read, okay? If that's the dynamic, you want as many people reading your publication as possible, right? Yes. Okay. So why as publishers do we say the only way you can get access to my publication is to come to my website or for me to send you an email? If I work, for example, with an association – and I gave them an embed code and said to the association, look, Mr. Association, you can take my content, make your website more valuable to your members. They can read it right online. And, oh, by the way, um, it's completely free to you to do this. They're going to love it. 
And what happens is you make money off of them embedding your content off of your website. And instead of you saying, oh, I can get 40,000 people to my, my issue like you did when we used that calculator, Ed, maybe now you'll get 50,000 people to it. And you just made more money for yourself. So using uh, technology to your advantage is really key to circulation. So I guess the philosophy is don't have command and control where everything must go through you. Learn from YouTube. Learn from these uh, uh, viral, you mentioned BuzzFeed, right? I could go right here on, uh, so let's just take this article. Let's go, I'm going to go to an article. Let's go to Damon John, who, again, we got Damon John uh, to, to be with us. Damon is the star of uh, uh, the Shark Tank. So let's say a reader's reading this and they go through and they hear the interview and they say, wow, this is really just an awesome, awesome story. Let's, uh, I want to share it on Facebook. So I go here, I share the story, and I could go on my you know, timeline here and I could just write, love Damon, great story. Right? So I do that. I could share it publicly. I could share it in groups and, and all this kind of stuff. So I'm just going to share this link. All right. Now, if we open up my Facebook page, and these are live demos, Ed, right? So you hope everything goes well. <laughs> right there, you can see it's right, it's right up there. And so I have over 3,000 people who I'm connected with on Facebook. So some of them are going to see this in their news feed. But watch what happens here, right? And this, again, is – oh, look at this. We already got a like on that. Love the <laughs> um, – so now it's going to appear in, in his feed, right? So now watch what happens. I click here, and the reader who saw it on my feed opens up that magazine – and it opens up right to the story that I shared. Now, I could have shared it on any social network. I could have shared the whole magazine. But now as this reader comes in and they go through a bunch of pages, I just use social media to make me money, right? And one other example, and I know we're, I, I want to leave time at the end for some questions. I'm going to show you another little technology that we built called the Custom Newsstand. And uh, – this is an example of the embed code that you can use. So here um, we have Losing It magazine. You can actually read it right in the, in the magazine. We allow a partner to uh, put their ads and the background all around it. All of this is customizable. Like I could go here under settings. I could come in here. Uh, I could do a custom newsstand uh, approach where I could pick um, – Let's just say I want to leave it uh, as this newsstand, or I can edit the list so I could choose some magazines and not others, and it dynamically adjusts. And you, you know, for those of you who have multiple publications, you use this, and then you let your partners run ads around it. But when somebody comes in and they say, "Ah, well, you know, I'm interested in Couples Max magazine. I want to read the current issue." Well. Great. So they go the magazine and they can read it right through this technology. So you got to be thinking about how do you co-opt partners into working with you and and taking advantage of their audience and their traffic. I uh, I can see how uh, many advertisers that want to do something their competition uh, isn't uh, might want to take advantage of this. Yeah. Uh, I did want to leave some time. We've gone over just about two minutes. Um, I have one last question, and then I'm going to open up a brief Q&A. Uh, Larry, I'm really curious as to how you would respond to this. Yep. Let's imagine a scenario where a president of a publishing company called a special meeting with all the publishers and department heads to set a strategy to compete in this coming year and beyond. All of, the career, all of their careers might depend on what they decide. What course of action would you recommend? Well, I kind of lived that uh, experience personally. Um, so, uh, well, let me tell you, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I would do. And I'm going to show you how to do it for next to nothing, which means not, so publishers, you know, so many times we think, well, I, I have my one or two or three publications. You could do this and you could go into other markets really, really easy. So the first thing I would do, Ed, is that I would partner with an industry luminary 
or an industry organization. That will give you credibility out of the gate. It helps the sales story, and also it'll help circulation. So you can jumpstart your circulation without having to buy lists and spend money. The second thing that I would do, uh, I had mentioned earlier, is I would not hire a huge editorial staff. I would literally hire one person or use existing staff, and I would go to the leading thought leaders in that industry, and I would convince them on becoming an editorial contributor. The other thing I would do is I would use our Mag Titan software. Out of the gate, you use this software, you are better than any publisher in your industry. I would use our Ad Einstein software because you can then choose to have paper performance um, uh, offering with better technology um, and it'll allow you to build revenue digitally. Um, and I would also not publish a huge amount of content to start it. I publish five stories and a new one each week or build in a newsletter each week so you can keep driving people back and back and back to the issue. And on that note, let me just say, our Mag Titan software, our starter level is completely full functioning and it's free completely free. So anybody can start and port your magazine over to the platform. Um, so what I'll do is, um, and, and I'll show my email at the end, but for those of you um, uh, who are interested in getting a free Mag Titan account, you can just write to me at Larry at of 11 media, spell out of 11 media.com. And uh, I'll send you a registration uh, link so that you can have a, uh, a free Mag, Mag Titan account. Okay, uh, Larry, thank you very much. I think you've uh, raised the eyebrows of uh, many of the attendees on this, uh, on this call. Um, we've got lots and lots and lots of questions that came from publishers. I've only picked a couple because I didn't want to go that much over. Okay. Um, <clears throat> question, Larry, what are the, some of the biggest mistakes you've seen publishers making today? Um, giving away digital advertising. Um, you know, we've seen this movie before when publishers give away, like they give away content, it's hard to get people to pay for content right now. That genie's out of the bottle, that ship has sailed. We don't want it to happen with digital advertising. We know, um, you know, if, if we go here, I'm just going to pull over this uh, uh, slide from before. Let's go here. Um, we know the statistics, right? The statistics are going to be that uh, digital advertising is going to be the leader. And if the digital advertising is the tail that wags the dog, then what we need to do is we need to make it so that you're charging for digital advertising and you're making money off of that. And, and that's just flat. So I wouldn't make that mistake. The second thing that I see publishers doing that's wrong is not paying as much attention to the design of the digital issue as the print issue. This is a mistake. You have to pay as much love and care to your digital design. If it's an afterthought, people are going to end up not being able to read it like you see with print replicas. And you know what? If you work with us, you don't have to do the work. You can. It's completely free. You use our software, and it's great. But if you don't have the staff to do that, and it doesn't take much staff, you, you pay a couple dollars, not big bucks, and our staff will do it. You looked at that USA Today issue before. That's all our design staff doing it. So you got to pay attention to the digital issue. Banner ads, Ed. Banner ads are a loser. The prices are going to continue to drop. You're going to cannibalize your premium ads. It's a mistake. Um, putting too much content on a website is a mistake as well. And paying too much for editorial, uh, you know, with staff, it drives up your costs. It makes you keep your rates at a certain level uh, to achieve certain profits, and then you price people out of the market because you have all this overhead. Um, so I see those as some of the biggest mistakes, just off the top of my head. Uh, Larry, you're uh, uh, you're well liked by the attendees. The questions are pouring in, but I've now gone a few minutes <clears throat> a few minutes over, so I'm only going to ask one more question. And I think for the publishers in the audience, this is something they really want to see. One publisher says, for an advertiser, what do they need to do to get an ad to work on all the different size devices? Can you show us some before and after static and animated ad examples? I can, um, and it's a great question. And the good news is it's not hard because, um, you know, our software does that, that heavy lifting. 
Uh, let me pull up here. Let me see if I can find it. Let's go into um, Supply Chain Brain is a great client of ours. Um, and they, you know, basically were doing what every other trade publisher does. Actually, watch this cover. This is kind of cool. So now the, the magazine loads. So um, let's pull this up here. Let me actually, the best way to get here. All right, so here's an ad. And actually, this is uh, the issue that, I, that you're looking at here. We um, tweaked for their sales team so that they could go out and sell programs to people and kind of demo this new software. This is the first issue that we've done with them. So what you see here is that an ad, a replica ad, just like the static as it appeared originally in Supply Chain Brain Magazine. Now I'm going to flip the page and you'll see how we're using the Ad Einstein and Mag Titan software, how it changed. All right, so now first, we had a little sneeze animation. We have a headline here that's very visible. And now if somebody's interested, they can click on it. Oh, by the way, as soon as they click, Supply Chain Brain Magazine is going to be making money because that's a verified view. Um, so we click on this ad, and now watch what happens. Okay? And if you're interested in any of these areas, let's say I'm interested in logistics. Now it uses the web window. So you're now on the Kenco website. And you can get all about what you're interested in. You can download their white paper, all the functionality that's already on their, on their website. So that's one example. Um, here's, let's flip forward to another example. Okay, so here's an ad for Purolator, as it regularly is. And again, you can see that when you do a replica, the text is too small. It's, it's horrible. But when you convert it to our software... And I don't know if you can really see it, but there's an animation effect where we took the image and we kind of made it move a little bit. The plane moves a little bit. So it just gives that little bit of motion. They can click on any parts of this and open it up. And those are just two quick examples. Uh, I've got a lot more that I, I could try. I have this one. Uh, I love that the USA Today with a, with a, a balloon. Should I, do I have time for one more, Ed, or no? You've got about 10 seconds, and then I, then we're going to be signing off. All right. Let's see really quickly, because I love this one. Oh, well, and while I find this, are there any other quick questions or no? No, no. I'm going to give you one last shot at showing a great animated ad, and then we're going to wrap it up. All right. Let's go here. I have all these windows open. I, I have like 50 windows open. You know I get all excited about this, because I am part, part geek here. Let's go to where I know this ad is in the back somewhere. I think it's after this story. So let's go in. So I think we did the same thing here. Let me turn the page. So here's an ad. Again, this was for USA Today's Home Magazine. So you have a water heater ad, right? And this is what it looked like originally in the publication. And through Ad Einstein, watch what happens. And I need... And then, if you'd like, if you're interested, notice how much easier it is to read. And then you can say, hey, you want to get a water heater installed? You know, click and find a, a dealer. So I'm here in Sarasota, Florida. So if I go 34236 and I click find a dealer, I can actually go in and generate a lead for them right here through their, uh, through their website. So that's just some examples. Larry, Larry, thank you very much. For everyone that attended uh, this, uh, this briefing today, hopefully you've got uh, at least a few strategies you could start moving forward on to start monetizing your digital editions. Um, Larry, thank you very much. Uh, this, is, this has given me uh, 
uh, lots and lots and lots of uh, thought processes for the future. And as Larry suggested a couple of times during this briefing, uh, please email him directly at Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, at of11media.com. If you've got any questions, send them out to him right away. Again, thank you, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you hopefully, you've enjoyed the experience today. Take care.